Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stuart Cohen. He has 20 years in the high-tech industry in various executive positions, including IBM, InFocus, and Radisys. You know, it, not coincidentally, the buzz about open source technology started in Oregon about three years ago. Well, three years ago, Stuart Cohen became the head of the open source development lab in Beaverton, and that's the time the buzz started. We picked up on that buzz, and we created the open source lab as something that would complement the work they were doing, the Open Technology Business Council, the curriculum at PSU. We're not stepping on anybody's toes. We work together, and we try to do what we each do best. Stuart has come here today to share what's happening in the U.S. and around the world with Linux and open source. It's my pleasure to welcome Stuart. So let me spend a couple of minutes today talking to you a little bit about what's going on. From an agenda standpoint, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the Open Source Development Lab so you know who we are and what we're all about. I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening with Linux and what's happening globally with that. A little bit about what's going on in the different governments around the world and some of the issues here in Oregon. Um, as well as in the United States, and then we can spend a few minutes talking about what exactly is going on in Oregon and this buzz that's kind of happened over the last three years. And then what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking to you, and then I'd be happy to address any questions that you have. So we could probably spend half the time maybe with me talking and half the time in more of a dialogue with you, answering any questions you might have, and some things that we could do as next steps as we move forward. So a little bit about OSDL. We got formed in 2000, <coughs> Excuse me. and the concept in 2000 was pretty simple. There were a set of developers out there in the world that were developing the Linux kernel. Uh, that number was ranging anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 people that were out there. They were all primarily doing it, as you know, on their own, on the side, as a passion, or as a real issue that was really going on in the marketplace, and something where they had a serious problem that they wanted to go work on. Well, these seven companies got together and they formed the Open Source Development Lab with a simple concept. Let's create a non-profit, vendor-neutral data center where the development community can basically send their projects over the internet and they can see how they scale. Because the thought was they had laptops, they had desktops, maybe they had small two-way servers. But four-way, eight-way, 16-way, 32-way, they probably didn't have access to it and they probably didn't feel comfortable sending it to a vendor's data center for benchmarking, for testing, for scalability, because they really thought they were going to get hijacked, or they were going to get corrupted, or they were going to get corroded, or they were going to get destroyed, or something was going to happen to them. So the idea of building a vendor-neutral site was very, very important to these seven companies to really test for scalability. As you can imagine, with three of those companies being based in Tokyo, the need for one of the centers to be in Tokyo made a lot of sense. The four companies based in the United States focused on the United States. That's how we ended up with an office in Tokyo and an office in Beaverton at the exact same time. And that's really where it started. Well, in about six months after that, about 50 projects were running, approved. They, were, uh, they certainly validated the idea of scalability. And it really led to a series of things happening. The next idea was a data center work group and a wireless infrastructure or carrier grade work group, which then led to a set of technical requirements and market requirements and a steering committee that looked across that. Well, what very quickly happened was seven companies went to about 20 companies, and it rolled into an environment where now, if you look at the carrier grade market, what has happened, and you all remember the, uh, the Thames or the NEPs, if you will, the Nokias, the Alcatels, the Ericsons, the Nortels of the world, 2000, 2001, 2002, they were going through dramatic change. Okay? They, were, you know, they were laying people off by the tens of thousands. They were reducing cost, costs by the tens of millions. Well, now you look at the work that was done with these users and these vendors together, there was a set of specifications developed and different distributions have responded to that different ways. And now 90 plus percent of the design wins in the wireless infrastructure area in these companies around the world are now using Linux or carrier grade Linux as a specification. So there's been a tremendous adoption, a tremendous rate of return on that. That has led to various different activities that we have done from data center to desktop to carry grade, and soon you're going to see us do something around a mobile Linux initiative around cell phones and smartphones and the PDA devices as they fit into a wireless infrastructure. So if you look at it today, we now have about 75 to 80 member companies. Uh, about a third of them are based 
outside the U.S. in Asia. Uh, we've got about another 10% that are based in Europe. Uh, we have an office in Europe, an office in Beijing, the office in Tokyo, the office here. And we are now working on technical issues, business issues, legal issues, market issues, kind of all around the acceleration of Linux. We were fortunate enough to have Lena Torvalds and Andrew Morton, the number one and number two people in the development community as it relates to the Linux project, come to work for us. We were also fortunate to have Andrew Tridgel come to work for us as an OSDL fellow who's the lead of the Samba project because it became more and more obvious activities around Samba and NFS and interoperability between Windows and Unix and Linux was very, very important. So it became a critical area for us and we were glad to invest in him as a developer coming on board. So now we're focused, as I said, on how do you roll out Linux, how do you roll it out around the world. So a brief history, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this kind of walked you through kind of what we've done over the last five years. The reason I show you this chart is a couple of interesting things. We have three basically customer advisory councils, if you will. Global 2000 CIOs, CTOs, people who work for them, one in the US, one in Europe, one in Japan. They meet three or four times a year talking about business issues and global issues. Well, you all probably remember a few years ago the SCO lawsuit, where SCO was talking about suing IBM and Novell and Red Hat, and damn near anybody who's doing anything with Linux. And one of the things was they were talking about threatening a bunch of end users. Well, our customer advisory council said, you know, you need to come up with something in place. And we announced this Linux defense fund. And this defense fund was really designed for if SCO went to sue any end users, we would have something in place. Well, we raised about $3 million in less than seven days. And it tells you where these people were on raising money because they didn't want to see end users get sued. They didn't want to see end users going through that. And it's come about to an extent that now both AutoZone and Daimler Chrysler both did what we were kind of quite frankly hoping they would do, which was get behind all the vendors and not create a situation where users would start to get sued around the world. So that has worked and worked very well. One of the other things that came up out of that customer council was we are starting to run a lot of open source applications. And a lot of those open source applications are running mission critical applications. And those projects are a set of developers and they write great code and they have great processes around those codes. But what are they doing around legal services? What are they doing around licensing? What are they doing about business processes and business management? Which is one of the reasons why we introduced the IP fund that we introduced earlier this year. And it's one of the reasons why we pledged over $4 million to the Software Freedom Law Center in New York City that Evan Bogman's running out of Columbia University. Because we thought it was very important that legal services be provided to some of these key open source projects that we're starting to run more and more mission critical applications around the world. That and the revisioning of the GPL, which Linux ships under, and about 40,000 other projects around the world are looking at and using. It was a great opportunity to use that to look at new models as the revisioning of the GPL goes forward. So this gives you a feel for some of the companies that are members of OSDL. Um, it's primarily big and small vendors, as I said, about a third in Asia, about 10% in Europe. Uh, we have some end users involved. We have them heavily involved in our customer advisory councils, where we have about 20 in each of the three geographies. And you're seeing it's a growing number of people. And you can see us to continue to announce new members over the coming weeks. So as I said, we're really, as a mission, focused on being you know, the central body for accelerating the use of Linux and open source software. We want to be the place where vendors and users and developers all come together in one place to talk about issues. Once again, whether technical, business, marketing, whatever it might be. The other thing that we're doing, we're focusing on a couple of very specific areas which are, which are becoming major concerns as people start to develop more Linux and start to deploy more Linux and start deploying more open source. The opportunities are out there are greater. The value proposition for end users, the customer confidence in end users continues to go up. There's more and more issues that are going on in the marketplace. So we want to stay focused on all those activities as an organization. Let me spend a little bit of time talking about Linux Excel. As you probably know, uh, Linux has had double digit growth quarter on quarter for the last 14 quarters. As I said, it's starting to run more and more mission critical applications. A lot of them around government applications, a lot in financial services, a lot in manufacturing, 
industry verticals around the world. So there's a tremendous amount of need for the type of infrastructure, the type of ecosystem to support mission critical applications. The other thing is you're seeing VC starting to fund these. I think there's been 43 open source companies funded on the West Coast since the beginning of the year. So there's starting to be a tremendous groundswell of people looking to take advantage of the model of developing open source software, working that with proprietary software, sometimes doing that in some sort of dual license capability, but giving companies the flexibility to use open source software and use proprietary software and use it together in a working model. The other thing is a strong involvement in governments. And we'll spend some more time talking about this, but the activities that are going on around the world and they're going on in the United States, while they're dramatically different, the government as a, as a vertical and as a user are getting much more actively involved in Linux, getting much more actively involved in open source, and having a huge impact on the marketplace. So to show you kind of what some of the numbers look like and why this is turning into big business, what this chart shows is a couple of things. It shows that the servers, the PCs, and the uh, software for Linux itself in the enterprise market, okay, not supercomputing and not uh, handheld devices and not consumer electronics and not cell phones and mobile equipment, but just servers and PCs and the software. In 2004, it was about a four, was about a, uh, excuse me, about a $12 billion business. It is growing to about a $36 billion business <coughs> by 2008. So very rapid growth over the next couple of years. The other thing is, if you look at the software that's running on top of it, there was about $4 billion worth of software that was running on top of Linux in 2004. That number is expected to be over $14 billion worth of software by 2008. So there's a big transition to what's going on with that. And we'll spend a second on the next chart talking a little bit about that. But one of the questions that everybody asks is, well, where's, where's open source in that? And if you're an open source developer and you're an open source company, well, very little of that in the $4 billion in 2004 was open source. When you look at 2008, almost $2 billion is open source software in that. So the open source software comes from almost nothing to about $2 billion worth of revenue for software and for services around that in the 2008 time frame. So a pretty substantial growth. At the same time, the proprietary software goes from about $4 billion to about 12 billion. So a significant growth on the proprietary side as well, which most of you as users understand very well because you have a lot of proprietary software that you have running on top of Linux today. Your plan is to probably roll out more and more Linux servers and more of that transition of software is going to happen. A lot of that's going to bring priority, proprietary, but you're going to focus on open source and how it mixes into that at the same time. So this gives you a little bit of a feel for what's happening from a market standpoint. If you look at the data center, um, Linux is at about almost at 10% from a server marketplace. There's a lot of expectations as to how high that's going to go. Um, I will tell you from a lot of the global 2000 companies that, that we deal with around the world, they all have kind of the same model. Their model is they have five to 10,000 Windows servers today. They have two to 5,000 Linux servers today, and they have three to 5,000 Unix servers today. And a lot of them are saying, we see the point where they're going to transition where there'll be 10 or 15,000 Windows servers. There'll be 10 to 15,000 uh, Linux servers, and there'll be you know, anywhere from two to 3,000 Unix servers. And that's why the interoperability between Windows and Linux is so important. And that's why you see this number anywhere from 30 to 40 to 50 percent of the marketplace over a very short period of time as people are deploying more and more, you know, Intel-based, AMD-based, PowerPC-based, PC-based servers. The same is true on the embedded space. It's growing and growing very rapidly. Um, as an example, if you look at the cell phone market, about 4 percent of the cell phones in the world are running Linux today. What you also see is you see every cell phone manufacturer in the world running Linux today on some part of their product line. And they're all looking at evaluating that. If you look at the smartphone market, obviously a lot smaller, but growing very rapidly. The smartphone market doubled from the first quarter shipments this year to the second quarter shipments this year. Doubled in worldwide volume of smartphones. At the same time, Linux was 13% the first quarter of the overall market. 
over 25% in the second quarter in the overall market. So the market doubled and Linux doubled at the same time. Now these are the Gartner numbers that Gartner are producing and we're all looking at what's going to happen in the third quarter, what's going to happen in the fourth quarter, how is the shift going on. The only reason I bring it up is because you're seeing a lot of different Linux and open source software getting included in a lot of different embedded devices. And I think you're going to continue to see that grow and grow. The other area is the, is the desktop. And on the desktop, there's more Linux out there on desktops than there are Apple computers out there in the world. Now that's a phenomenal statistic within itself. Um, one of the things that I kind of poke at with the development community is I always tell them that if you're a mobile professional um, like myself who carries a laptop and has a Blackberry or a, you know, or a Treo or a cell phone and it's integrated in, you know, all the issues around the mobile professional, there is no easy to use yet set of applications for the desktop. And yet it's having the success that it's having. Now there's a lot of things on the horizon. There's a lot of things that are going to change that. There's a lot of things going on at Nobel and the Hula Project and the Chandler Project and other projects around the world where, and open office obviously and all the activities that they have. So there's a tremendous opportunity for huge success. But my point is, if you look at call centers, if you look at help desks, if you look at you know banking devices, teller machines and ATMs and point of sale, Linux is already having a tremendous amount of success. And it's starting to have success in the client server environment where if you have a user that's got a desktop computer and they need a browser, well Firefox is a terrific solution for them. If they manage their own calendar, if they manage their own email, if they're spending time looking at a client server application that's running on a server in their department or in their agency or in their region, it is a great solution for that desktop. And the community is making great progress as it relates to the mobile computing environment. So I think you're going to see this only continue to expand. And that's kind of a US statement. When you look at some countries around the world where they're really rolling out PCs in big and broad fashion, and a lot of people get PCs for the first time, you're seeing this happen more and more and more. And we'll spend a couple more minutes talking about what some governments are doing in that area. Let me spend a second kind of giving you an example so you see what's going on. And those of you that are IT professionals, you probably have seen this. If you look in 2000, there were a lot of people running RISC architecture with Unix on top of it. They were paying anywhere from ten to $50,000 for that piece of hardware. They were paying anywhere from five to $15,000 for that Unix operating system that was running on top of it. And then there was a whole set of middleware and application software on top of that, all proprietary. When you look at what's going on as we get to 2005, the market has really shifted. People have put in servers, Intel-based, AMD-based, PowerPC-based. And on top of that, they're running Linux, mostly from a distribution where they're buying a subscription or they're buying a service contract or a support contract. You know, they may have in-house people that are doing their work. But what you see is those people that were spending thirty, forty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars on that workstation or that server are now doing that for five and six and seven and ten thousand dollars. They're doing it for what was, the, what was less than the price of the maintenance. So the hardware and the OS were really driving the behavior initially. And then what you're going to see over the next few years is as open source software starts to move into those pieces and starts to adapt to that change. And that's where we really see the market going and we see the real market opportunity. And that sliding scale on the hardware and that sliding scale on the software is where you get $14 billion going to $36 billion between now and 2008 and where you see the software component going from $4 billion to $14 billion. And as I said, a lot of it's proprietary software, but the open source software is continuing to make progress into that space. And obviously up above, that is a potential for additional IT investment. So from an opportunity as a user, a lot of that money gets poured back into the business, into new applications, new application areas, new business opportunities. And at the same time, you can see all that money available is why it's good for the vendors, which is why all the vendors are involved in the promotion of Linux, the promotion of open source, because it's additional opportunities for hardware and software and services for them to support the business needs of their customers. So let's talk a little bit about the impact on Linux and open source and governments. Um, one of the things that's going on, there's been some discussions obviously over the last day and a half, and I heard a little bit from, from Tom Raybon who kicked off the session yesterday, who got a chance to spend some time with some of the folks before he had to leave last night. He said it was terrific to meet some of the different people from around the United States and some of the different things that were going on at a state level, 
at a city level, at a federal level, around some of the different activities. And I think you're seeing more and more of that. And I know you've had a lot of dialogue and exchange about that over the last day and a half. The other thing that's going on is in the EU. Um, and when you look at what's going on in Europe, it's very interesting. It's changing dramatically. It's much more social, cultural oriented. There's a lot more issues around the source code availability. And I'll get to that in a second on the next chart. Also a little bit about what's going on in what's called the BRIC countries that everybody was referring to. In what's happening in in Brazil and in Russia and in India and in China and Korea. All the different activities where the governments are getting heavily involved in those type of things. Let me spend a couple minutes talking about global success stories. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on here in Oregon and the cluster that we have in place and some of the things we're trying to do. But for instance, if you see what's going on in China, there's a tremendous opportunity not only for the deployment of Linux and open source software, but it is a huge economic development opportunity. As they're rolling out more and more PCs, they're looking for software that's developed by their countrymen and their countrywomen to get deployed by their countrymen and countrywomen. So there's a big push for a software ecosystem that's being put in place. When you look at Japan, the focus on the internet and connectivity is key in Japan. You know, As you know, it's a lot of big businesses running big equipment. At the same time, there's more people accessing the internet in Japan off cell phones and smartphones and PDAs than there are off computers in the world. So where Linux and where open source fits into that model continues to be of greater and greater importance. You've probably seen or heard where the ministers of information industry from China, Japan, and Korea all stood up about a year and a half ago and said, we're going to work in collaboration where we want to make sure we have an open source strategy for these three countries and how we're going to deploy open source solutions as a region and what we're going to do in each one of our countries. That has led to a whole series of projects what's called the Open Source Software Promotional Forum in Japan, where there's a whole series of Japanese companies on what they do in Japan specifically. It's led to the Ministry of Information Industry and the Ministry of Science and Technology in China talking specifically how do they collaborate, how do they deal with the different provinces, how do they pull them together, and how do they make sure big business, big government, and the provinces around China all work together on an established plan around open source. So you're seeing these governments come together. They're funding businesses, they're funding organizations, they're funding projects to leverage Linux and open source for a lot of that business behavior. As an example, in, in Stuttgart and in Munich, you've heard a lot about what's going on in Munich and the city of Munich. But in Stuttgart specifically, they came to OSDL and they said, could you help us set up something similar to the Open Technology Business Center that was formed in Beaverton? And what they said was, if you, OSDL, will put some money into a center in Stuttgart, we will invest basically four times that money into that center because they want to see what's the model for businesses and government and education coming together to work on economic development opportunities for their city and for their region. So these type of activities are taking place all over the world. Same is true in India and in Vietnam. And the one other example I bring up is Thailand. Uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology in Thailand, I was at a conference where I spoke of uh, a couple of months ago in Shanghai, and he was actually there at the same time, and he spoke at the conference, and what he said was, basically, with the economic boom on one side of them in China, and the economic boom on the other side of them in India, without Linux and without open source, as a minister of science and technology, he can't get it rolled out fast enough, because it's the only way he's going to educate enough people in his country, and he thinks it's the only way to keep the smart people in Thailand working on issues in Thailand without having them go to India or without having them go to China. So he thinks, as a competitive advantage, he's got to make sure he's bringing along people and he's bringing along people on a platform that he can roll out from a business standpoint that works, works for him and works very rapidly. The other thing that's going on domestically, you heard yesterday from Linda Hamill and the activities that are going on in Massachusetts around Open Document, and I won't spend any more time talking about that. But it was also interesting at Linux World earlier this summer uh, in San Francisco, all of these different groups, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, all came to Linux World. All were talking about what they are doing with Linux, what they're doing with open source, what they're doing across these agencies, not only in the United States, but within their agencies globally, and how they're starting to talk about sharing these among those agencies. I think there's a tremendous opportunity to leverage that. And one of the things that we've talked about internally in some of the, the dealings we've had is, you know, as you have success in one state, 
how do you share that with the other states? And how do you use Linux and how do you use open source in an environment where all the cities don't have to replicate the work and all the states don't have to re replicate the work? And how do you get tremendous leverage across that? And I think that's something that we're going to continue to spend more and more time on. The other thing that's important is, as I said, this ability to implement cross-agency applications. The idea to do it on open standards. It's not just open source software. It's just not just hardware. But it's really standards across the board. And how do you develop those standards? How do you use those standards? How do you deploy those standards? So people can really derive value and create a real innovation model around that. So I think that continues to be the key to what's going on. The other thing that's going on is the security and flexibility that you get from Linux, from the open source community, from the developers, and harnessing the leverage of work that they're doing around that. The other area is the capital investment. If you can get the cities, or you can get the states, or you can get the agencies to share those, they're not all duplicating the same efforts. They're not having the same upfront costs. And they get to take advantage of that chart I showed on the right-hand side, where you get to make your hardware expenses, your software expenses, you have services expenses, but you get to share much more from an open source standpoint, from a community standpoint. And as your users are making requests, your developers or the open source community are working on those enhancements. Some of that stay within your city or your state or your government <coughs> as a competitive advantage or as a unique application. Some of it gets given back to the community and that gets shared across everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing that I mentioned is, you know, it's so important what's going on around the world and the activities specifically around economic development. It is a very different business model. And if you look at it, in the U.S., it's really about business and money. At the end of the day, that's really what's driving this. Um, the governments are involved, but they're not involved anywhere near the way they are around the world. And it's really about how do I get much better price performance? How do I get price performance on that chart that I showed? And how do I start to deploy more and more of that because I'm under tremendous expense pressure, tremendous people pressure, and i got to make sure I'm doing the best job I can from a business and money, from a return on investment, from a profitability and ROI standpoint. And some of the examples of that, I mean, if you look at what MySQL is doing, it's running about 75% of what some of the proprietary databases are at today. So you're seeing a lot of people start to take advantage of MySQL. Now, that doesn't mean that people are throwing out their DB2 or their Oracle or their, uh, or their Microsoft SQL Server databases, because in a lot of cases, it is the fabric of people's businesses. It is the way they run. It's the way they operate. But what you're seeing happen is a lot of people are moving those applications, and they're moving some new applications. They're taking advantage of open source databases, and they're really leveraging that in new server environments, in new application areas. <coughs> the same is true in open office. It's about 75% less. It's based on standards. It fits well into the different marketplaces. And as I talked about earlier, if you're in a fixed function, help center, call desk, client server type application, that works very well. And I think it'll only get stronger and stronger in the mobile professional environment as that continues to move and move along. In other areas, you look at Linux, you look at Apache, MySQL, they've got enormous user bases. And those user bases are growing all the time. And it's creating an opportunity where I tell people the big group of IT uh, or excuse me, the big group of open source developers in the wave, the next wave over the next five to ten years, they're going to come from IT professionals today. Because as more and more IT departments are deploying more and more Linux and open source activities, the more they're going to get requests from users, the more as they respond to those user requests, as I said, some things they're going to use internally, some things they're going to give back to the community. And more and more of those IT professionals that are doing internal software development in the past are going to get much more involved in application development on an open source basis going forward, which is going to lead to better and better innovation, better and better ideas, and it's going to give you the opportunity to get a lot more value from a lot more of your peers around the world. The other thing, obviously, is, is standards and source code availability. We talked a little bit about that, you know, how important that is in the EU. Um, it seems to be much more important in the EU than it necessarily is in the US than it necessarily is in Asia. The other areas around patent reform, you know. You know, everybody's heard the numbers where half to three quarters of the patents that have been approved in the last 15 years are probably not valid patents. So how do you deal with patents? How do you deal with patent reform? You know, there's a lot of people who think the patent offices all ought to be closed and patents ought to go away and there shouldn't be anything around patents. You know, the reality is it's going to transition over a long, long period of time. 
but there's certainly issues around patent reform that we think are very important, um, that a lot of our member companies think are very important, and I think it's going to change the landscape for what we're doing. That's why you see uh, people make patent pledges, plat patent pledges, uh, like the things that, that IBM has done and Red Hat's done and Nobel's done, some of the things that Sun has done and Nokia and Ericsson. They're starting to make their patents available to different communities or to a broad set of open source communities. We think that type of thing's important. You'll see us at OSDL announce a patent commons in the next few weeks that's going to give IT professionals the opportunity to come see where all those patents are, how they're used, how you can use them, and how you can develop and, uh, and continue to innovate off that. Let me spend just a second talking about what's going on in Oregon because it's kind of a unique story. And if you look at what's going on here, not only is it, is it the work that we're doing, and I'm obviously very proud of the work that we're doing at OSDL and the work that we're doing around the world, but the fact that Linus is here and the work that he's doing, some of the subsystem maintainers that work for us, but as importantly, if you look at what Intel's doing here, you know, Intel's biggest facility in the world is here in Oregon, and the activity that Intel has taken on around microprocessors and servers and now with the people that they have around Linux and open source making that work in all those platforms is very, very critical. Their director of Linux strategy is here in Oregon. When you look at, at IBM, their Linux technology center is here as well as in multiple other places. They've got a couple thousand people in those Linux technology centers around the world. The vice president that runs it for all their worldwide Linux technology is here in town as well. When you look at a new opening, the Open Technology Business Center. This was something that was put in place earlier this year by the city of Beaverton. And the focus was really around helping startups. Helping startups get started with business processes, business models, education, training, as related to get, starting, get started in this activity. This was a very, very important function. Portland State University has a similar acceleration center that they have in place. There's a lot of different agencies around the state of Oregon that are helping with this. It's very, very important as we create an environment where startups can get going. The other thing, you've heard a lot about Oregon State University and Portland State University. They're doing a tremendous amount around open source, the Firefox activities, the hosting of, of kernel.org at Oregon State University and the open source lab are very, very critical to the operations that are happening here. And the things that are going on in the computer science department at Portland State and the activities that Dean Dryden has put in place, I think it's really getting a situation where our universities, in partnership with business, in partnership with government, are all working together on that. The other things, people like Sun and Oracle are here in town, a couple of hundred people working on application development. You know, the people that are probably making the most money on Linux right now is probably Oracle. I think they announced last quarter 70% of their new license shipments are going out running on top of Linux today. So there's a significant opportunity for what Oracle is doing. And I think you're seeing that happen in various businesses around the world. Almost every single one of the top uh, 100 ISPs in the world all have products that are running on Linux today. And I think you're going to continue to see that big, a bigger and bigger portfolio of what they're doing. The other thing that I want to mention was, from a government standpoint, uh, the, government, the governor has gotten very actively involved in what we're doing. The, uh, <clears throat> the Oregon Economic Development Commission has also gotten very involved. Uh, they have funded a coordinator for this cluster, if you will, of about 30 organizations, business organizations, government organizations, education organizations, all around developing an economic development model for the state of Oregon that one, we can leverage here, but also we can build here and then go replicate in other places around the world. So we think that's a tremendous opportunity. Now to give you a feel for kind of the growth and the reach that it has, if you take those companies that are here in Oregon, and you look at the open source communities that are out there and the people that are here working on those and how they fit into those communities, you start to see a much broader spectrum, a much broader piece of the solar system, if you will, around what's going on here in Oregon and what's going on around the open source community. The same is true when you look at startups and private firms. The same is true when you talk about the big organizations that are doing a lot from a big vendor standpoint. So we think we're really uniquely positioned. The other thing I'll show you is just a some familiar names and faces of some people involved in this. And I won't go through all these people, but uh, the governor up on top of the work that he's doing with the Oregon Economic Development Commission and the work the governor is doing specifically around focusing on open source and open technology as a business cluster that he's really invested in 
and he believes there's a great opportunity for us to grow businesses here as well as help relocate businesses and an opportunity for us to leverage what we're doing from a deployment standpoint. The same is true with, uh, with Mayor Drake and Representative Wu and the activities that they've taken on. You see the people from Portland State, Clark, who, was, uh, who I mentioned earlier and thanked him for all his hard work. And then if you look at the people on the photo below, you see everybody from Deborah and the work that she's doing, to folks at IBM and at Intel and Lena Torvalds here. You can start to see a wide variety of people that are involved in this open source and open technology around the state of Oregon. And we're really going to try and leverage that into more and more of what we're doing here, and leverage that into more and more about what we can do to be more of a, a regional player, more of a federal player, and more of a global player around open source and open technology. Now, the other thing is, it fits well in, if you look at the projects that are going on, there's a lot of different projects that we're involved with, there's a lot of different projects that are, are specifically going on in the state of Oregon. So it's a great opportunity to continue to leverage what we're doing here with what we think we can be doing globally. So that kind of, uh, that wraps up uh, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today, a little bit about what OSDL is all about, tell you a little bit about the acceleration of Linux and where it's happening, what's happening with open source and some of the opportunities, give you a feel for some of the things that we're seeing globally from what governments are doing, uh, as well as some things that we're doing very specifically in Oregon that we think makes this a very uh, ripe opportunity for us from an economic development standpoint and from a deployment standpoint to use more and more things around open source. So uh, with that, I really wanted to, uh, to thank you all for coming, and I would be happy to answer a couple of questions before uh, you guys all adjourn and go off to the rest of your day.